uh, Acts chapter 2, um, from verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man who had God's approval. God did miracles, wonders and signs among you through Jesus. You yourselves know this. Long ago, God planned that Jesus would be handed over to you. With the, heat, with the help of evil people, you put Jesus to death. You nailed him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. He set him free from the suffering of death. It wasn't possible for death to keep its hold on Jesus. David spoke about him. He said, I know that the Lord is always with me because he is at my right hand. I will always be secure. So my heart is glad and joy is on my tongue. My whole body is, will be full of hope. You will not leave me in the place of the dead. You will not let your Holy One rot away. You always show me the path that leads to life. You will fill me with joy when I am with you. Fellow Israelites, you can be sure that King David died. He was buried. His tomb is still here today. But David was a prophet. He knew that God had made a promise to him. God had promised that he would make someone in David's family line king after him. David saw what was coming. So he spoke about the Messiah rising from the dead. He said that the Messiah would not be left in the place of the dead. His body wouldn't rot in the ground. God has raised this same Jesus back to life. We are all witnesses of this. Jesus has been given a place of honor at the right hand of God. He has received the Holy Spirit from the Father. This is what God has promised. It is Jesus who has poured out what you now see and hear. David did not go up to heaven, but he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. I will put your enemies under your control. So be sure of this, all you people of Israel. You nailed Jesus to the cross, but God has made him both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, it had deep effect on them. They said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, All of you must turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then your sins will be forgiven. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children. It is also for all who are far away. It is for all whom the Lord our God will choose. Peter said many other things to warn them. He begged them, save yourselves from these evil people. Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 people joined the believers on that day. The believers studied what the apostles taught. They shared their lives together. They ate and prayed together. Everyone was amazed at what God was doing. They were amazed when the apostles performed many wonders and signs. All the believers were together. They shared everything they had.
Awesome. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, yeah, we're going to take a little bit of time to look at that passage today. Um, last week was, was Pentecost Sunday, and we looked at the start of chapter two, and, and we're keeping going through chapter two. So as, as we go through today, it's still the same day um, as it's still Pentecost. There's just a long passage to describe what happened. We're going to break it up over a few weeks. Um, but yeah, if you were here last week, we, we looked at the, the Holy Spirit being given and, and empowering um, Jesus' disciples with God's presence, like his presence was in the temple, his presence is now in his um, followers, and empowered them to speak and to be his witnesses, like Jesus said would happen. And it starts by them speaking in other languages and getting the attention of all the people, and people are confused and asking questions, and some people are mocking. And so then that creates this context that Peter can then get up and speak, and it just gives some explanation as to what's going on. And, and he starts by saying that this is the fulfillment of prophecy, that God would give his spirit, that people would speak his words, um, but then goes on, and, and as will always happen in Acts, to, to then link that to Jesus, because they, what they are as witnesses to Jesus. So this is going on, it's, it's about, it's a fulfillment of scripture, God's at work, but it's because of Jesus, and it always comes back to that. That's why um, this series is called Witnesses, because really the key theme of Acts is that Jesus Followers have now been empowered to be his witnesses. Jesus is still the main character. He's the one at work by the Spirit, and all their job is to do is to point people to him and what he's still doing, what he did and what he's still doing by the Spirit. So you're going to look at that today, um, and yet yeah, we'll see Peter preaching incredibly confidently and powerfully, sharing good news and actually seeing people saved and converted and and that actually what we look at with Peter is, is to be an encouragement to us, that God wants to use us to be his witnesses, to share good news, to see people come to know him too. So let's pray, and then, then we'll go through the passage together today. We thank you, Jesus, for your life and your death, resurrection, that you're ascended on the throne, that you're worked by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for this story um, of Peter and the message that he brought that was so powerful and just pray that you'd encourage us and strengthen us uh, to be your witnesses um, in our homes, in our workplaces, God, with our friends, um, in whatever you're calling us to. Would you fill us with power to represent you and bring good news and life? And yeah, we thank you for how you meet us, and we just ask you to meet us and, and speak to us. Um, yeah, we just give this time to you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. So, um, yeah, we'll go through, this is, this is effectively a speech or a sermon that, that Peter gives in response to the questions and the accusations of the people. And we looked at the first part of it a little bit last week, that he says, well, these people are not drunk. There's some people saying they're drunk. He said, they're not. It's just the morning, and this is the fulfillment of Scripture. And then he links it to, to Jesus. But it's pretty intense, because he's speaking to people who not long ago were there, literally, when Jesus died. Some of them may be even in the crowd demanding that he be crucified. Now Peter is speaking this, this news about Jesus to them, but he's actually confronting them. He's speaking to a crowd of people, but he is so confident, and he's actually confronting them with the reality of what they've done and who Jesus is. So it's actually pretty intense. He says this, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep hold of him. It's just so interesting, even just how many times he says you, right? He's so confident. He's, he's putting the pressure on this crowd and saying, like, effectively, like, you knew that Jesus was a man of God. Like, there's no reason to not. Like, he did wonders. He did signs. God was with him. And even though that was the case, you killed him. Like, and he says, yes, technically the Romans did, but, but you were a part of it, he says to this crowd. But even in that, God was at work. It was a part of his plan. And God has worked to raise Jesus from the dead. So this is actually quite a confronting message to start with, right? You killed Jesus, but God was with him, and now he's alive. <laughs> like, 
And that would be quite a confronting thing to hear. Um, but Peter actually says that it was impossible for death to keep hold of Jesus. That they, they, the people, humanity, um, that this crowd of people were responsible for putting him to death, but death couldn't hold him. And the actual word, picture, and metaphor with the language is it's, it's like a reference to like labor pains and, and giving birth. And it's this kind of a strange metaphor, but it's like in a similar way, a woman who's in labor can't hold back her baby. Death couldn't hold back Jesus. Nothing could stop Jesus from coming back from the dead. It was in, unstoppable. Um, and and uh, Peter goes on to explain that this was also in fulfillment of Scripture. Again, he's speaking to Jewish people, and he's showing that actually this is the Messiah. This is what God was doing. So he references the Scripture written by David. It says, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices, and my body will rest in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Peter references this Psalm 16 written by David, but he's arguing that it's actually written prophetically about the Messiah and how he would be raised from dead. He wouldn't be kept in the grave. The death couldn't hold him. He would have life. Um, and he goes on to explain this, again, con continuing to confront them, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day, but he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Again, he's referencing Scripture to say that um, this is in fulfillment of Scripture, but then he also references the fact that they are witnesses. He effectively saying David saw this would happen, that, that the Messiah would rise from the dead, and we literally saw it happen. We saw Jesus alive from the dead. We are his witnesses, and it's the same Jesus that you killed. You killed him, but now he's alive from the dead. So Peter is so confident, and the message to start with at least is incredibly confronting. He says, effectively, the summary, the man God was working through, you killed, but God has raised him from the dead, and he is alive. And in some ways, that would be a scary thing to hear, right? Like, they are guilty, and they killed him, but now he's alive. Well, what's going to happen to them? Like, perhaps is what they're even thinking. He's confronting them with this truth, but at the same time, saying that actually, this was part of God's plan. Like, they were responsible for it. But actually, God was working through this, and God has raised him from the dead. The scriptures talk about this, and they themselves are witnesses of this. And partly, I think, the fact that Peter is speaking to a crowd that recently killed Jesus, yet he is so confident, is also an example to them that actually this is, this is true. Like, he has this confidence because Jesus is alive. And the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus, is kind of like that in that it actually and at least initially, is confronting because it actually reveals our brokenness and our sin. Um, in this case, it reveals the guilt of the crowd. But when we were going through Matthew, we said, well, yes, this crowd was the ones that killed Jesus, but actually all humanity are responsible. Actually, God came to earth, God came to reach humans, and humans' response was to kill him. And actually, we are all accountable for that. So the gospel actually reveals our sinfulness and brokenness that actually in our hearts, we would be people who would kill God. We would reject God. But the good news is that death can't stop God, that he's actually conquered death. Jesus is risen from the dead. And the good news then is that actually death has been defeated. The gospel confronts, but it also comforts, because if we believe, then this actually brings hope that actually there's resurrection from the dead. It was impossible for death to hold Jesus. He's risen and he offers eternal life so that we can have hope for the future. And we rec recognize the resurrection of Jesus initially to this crowd is confronting. Well, he's alive from the dead. But actually for us, we know that actually the fact that he's alive from the dead is actually means that we have hope. We have hope for the future. And Peter seems to have that hope because he's been so transformed that he can speak so boldly uh, probably partly because he's not afraid to die anymore. Like, death 
doesn't have the same power over him anymore. Death killed Jesus and then Jesus was fine. And he says it's gonna be the same for those who follow him. And that's the good news that we have as well, that actually the good news of Jesus is that we have hope for the future. The future, our future is actually not death. Though that might happen, that's not the end. It's simply a door into life and there's hope of eternal life and resurrection. There's this good news that as Jesus was raised, we will be too. We see this in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all we made alive. Peter confronts them with the reality that Jesus is back from the dead, but also the reality that Jesus is alive from the dead is a great comfort, because it means that if we trust him, we will also be raised. Death has actually been defeated. As we go through today, again, we're, we're thinking about this good news and, and what it means to us, but also what it would look like for us to be witnesses and sharing it too. So we're going to take some time to, again, just pray and reflect. And this, this is the first question I'll just give you a moment with today. How does the gospel give you hope for the future? And what would it look like to confidently share this with others, perhaps people who need hope and good news for the future? Again, I'll just give you a moment with that now. Keep going through um, Peter's speech. He, he first confronts them with the reality that of Jesus' resurrection. He, the message is that Jesus that you killed is alive. He's alive from the dead. Fulfillment of prophecy, we've seen it. Um, but it's, it's more than that, because it's not just that he's alive, but he's exalted as the Lord. He's the king. He's in charge of everything now. Um, he says this in verse 33, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Again, it's such a powerful thing that he proclaims and such a confronting message he gives to this crowd, but does it. And effectively, he's saying the Messiah God sent, you crucified, but God has now exalted him as Lord, and he is at work through the Holy Spirit. Again, the, the people's response to Jesus was to humiliate him and to crucify him, but God's response to Jesus was to exalt him and actually put him on the throne and to lift him up at the right hand. Humanity's response to God who comes is to reject him, but, but God takes Jesus and lifts him and puts him in that place. And again, this is in fulfillment of scripture, uh, uh, as he read another psalm uh, where David is speaking. And in this psalm, it's pretty confronting because it says, well, this, the Lord's on the throne and all his enemies will be in submission to him. And, and he, he's speaking to the people that killed him. So it's like, it's pretty confronting. Again, but it's not just the scripture. Now, Peter effectively is saying to them, and you see what's happening. He says, you can see what the Holy Spirit is doing. This, this thing that you can see is happening, this power is the Holy Spirit. And he says, that's the evidence that Jesus is on the throne because Jesus has sent that Holy Spirit. So he's saying, we've seen Jesus alive. 
and now you've seen the Holy Spirit at work, and that's the sign that Jesus is on the throne. Again, he's confronting them with this reality that Jesus is, is Lord, which maybe initially would be quite scary. They've rejected and crucified him. Now he's in charge of everything. What does that mean for them? Um, but again, we know God's heart to forgive. So when we hear that Jesus is Lord, it's an incredibly great comfort and that he's at work now and present by the power of the Spirit. See that though shamed, Jesus is now exalted. He is Lord and is with us by the Spirit, and we can rely on his power in the present. It's not just that the gospel is good news and gives hope for the future, but it's actually Jesus is Lord now, and Jesus is present now by the Holy Spirit and empowers us and works through us. Now we can have comfort in the present, We can trust him to be doing a transforming work in our own lives and hearts by the power of the Spirit, but also empowering us to be witnesses and to to represent him to people just like Peter is doing here as well. Uh, We can trust that he's doing a work in the world, and actually what we need simply is more of him and his power and his presence. And if we have that, we have what we need. There's this great encouragement um, in Hebrews, which kind of compares God's presence to to money in a sense saying, you don't need more money, you just need to recognize that we have God. Like that's all we need. He says it, this, keep your lives free from the love of money, be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what can mere mortals do to me? That Jesus is on the throne, we have the Holy Spirit, he's present with us, he's our helper, So actually, we can also be people who are confident. When we're seeking to represent him, when we're navigating issues of life, the encouragement is Jesus is in control, he's with us, there's a confidence that can come. So again, let's take a moment to to pray and, and reflect and to think through that about the gospel in the present. How does the gospel give you comfort and purpose now in the present? And again, what would it look like to share that with others? Um, so is that there's this idea of being witnesses, that, that like Peter is a witness to the resurrection, and then he sort of says to them, and you can see the Holy Spirit being at work as well. And then um, but it's not just that they can see the Holy Spirit at work, but then they actually experience for themselves the Holy Spirit in a sense, because what they experience is conviction. And, and the Holy Spirit's job is to convict And Peter has confronted them, and now the Holy Spirit convicts them. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? It makes sense, right? It's like, you killed Jesus and he's alive. You crucified him and he's the Lord. Like, whoa, like, what should we do? Like, and and the Spirit is at work convicting them. And there's an interesting contrast here as well, even in Peter's story, because just before Jesus was crucified, when he was being betrayed, um, Peter responded by cutting the servant of the high priest's ear and then going on to just deny Jesus and, and fall away. And effectively, when he did that, he wasn't representing Jesus' heart and way at all because Jesus' way is not of violence. P- Peter, in a sense, was not representing the gospel, but he was cutting. And then he's, ex- he's transformed through the resurrection and through the Spirit 
and now he gets up and speaks to people who could kill him, confidently confronts them, and the Holy Spirit uses his word to cut their hearts. And actually, um, when your heart is cut, it's a cut that heals. Uh, or in a sense, when the word of God pierces someone, it actually heals them. So Peter is, is cutting in a different way, and it represents how he's been transformed. Um, so they ask him, they're saying like, well, what should we do? And again, he, he speaks to them and answers their question. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is um, profound, right? And effectively, again, a summary of what he's saying is though you are guilty, you can be saved. Turn toward Jesus, identify with him fully, receive forgiveness and his presence. He, he confronts them, right? They're guilty of killing the Messiah, of crucifying the Lord. They may feel in a sense like, well, what's the hope for us? But then he shares the good news that, well, actually, the whole point is that Jesus has done this to save them. Actually, God's heart is to forgive them. And those who are guilty can actually be incorporated fully, identify fully with Jesus and experience that new resurrection life and Holy Spirit power as well for them, for the ones who were guilty and killed him. But it involves repentance, which is a change of mind. It's a turning away from the direction they've been going and turning toward Jesus. It involves an identification with Jesus, which is seen in baptism, which is really a sign of conversion and of loyalty and of, of demonstrating the internal change externally through baptism and, and of being cleansed. There's a forgiveness that's offered and there's power. Um, this is effect, this is this is the good news, right? Like they, they're confronted with their guilt, and then they're also confronted with the need to repent and be saved, but it's a comfort that actually there's forgiveness, there's life, there's power. And this promise is for them and for their children. These are the ones who opposed and killed Jesus. And amazingly, now they change, they're convicted, they're converted. God reaches them, the ones who kill his son. And in a sense, in this moment, Jesus' prayer is answered when he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And now 3,000 people are forgiven and they're transformed at this preaching. This is confronting news, but it's also amazingly good news that even though they were complicit in Jesus' death, this was God's plan all along to wreck it, to bring salvation and to bring freedom. Actually, Jesus has made a way for forgiveness. He is merciful and gracious, offering repentance, cleansing and transforming power, meaning we are not tied to our past. And this is really central to the gospel, is that God's heart is to forgive is to transform, is to heal, that is to actually take people, right, the crowds who are guilty of crucifying Jesus and saying that was their past, it's forgiven, they repented, and now there's new life, and now these 3,000 are now part of Jesus' followers, and they're now the witnesses that are going out to represent him into the world. God transforms the past, it doesn't have to dictate the future. This is incredibly encouraging for us, personally, um, because God forgives that actually where there's been guilt and failure and sin, he covers it and he cleanses it. And also that actually where there's been struggle and difficulty, that doesn't mean that has to be like that in the future, that he can transform, he can free, he can heal, there's hope. But this is also incredibly powerful and encouraging for us as we seek to represent Jesus in the world, because it means that people who are incredibly opposed to the message and, and maybe rejecting it, that doesn't mean that that's their future. That actually God can take people who are incredibly opposed to him and actually forgive them and transform them and then use them powerfully as his witnesses in the gospel. What we'll see later in Acts is, is the story of Saul, uh, who's the main persecutor of the church, who God confronts in Jesus, who forgives, transforms, and then uses effectively as the main leader of the church that his past is absolutely different to his future. Like that's what God does. He forgives and he transforms. So the encouragement is that we can actually be bold and confident 
that the Spirit has power to, to reach people who maybe we think have no hope, that actually He can do it like He's done it in the past, and their past doesn't have to be their future. So again, let's just take a moment to, to reflect on that, and, and even just God, your own experience of God's work in cleansing and forgiving your past, and what that might mean to share that with others. Another couple of questions. How have you experienced God's forgiveness and transforming power? What is it like to have the opportunity to share that with others? So these questions have been, yeah, encouragement to think about how we represent Jesus and our, his witnesses, but that um, sometimes can be a pretty difficult thing and, and something that makes us feel quite weak. It's not something that I feel very good at. Uh, sharing uh, with friends or other people is often, often, often difficult, I'm not sure how to say, and I often lack confidence. And I think the encouragement of this passage, though, is that there's an invitation for us to actually approach that with confidence, but not a confidence in ourselves and our ability to speak or explain, but a confidence in God and the reality of the Holy Spirit, that actually the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives. Actually, if we believe Jesus, that power lives in us. The Spirit is at work in people that we're talking to and relating to and who we work with, the Spirit's already meeting and working and has a plan for them, and we just get to be a part of that and to approach that with confidence that actually God could break in where maybe it seems in, impossible and to, to believe that. Um, Paul, the apostle, even approached things that way, not with a confidence in himself, but with a confidence in the Holy Spirit and God's a power to meet people. Um, he says this in 1 Corinthians 2. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, because I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness and great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power." that actually we can be people who are confident as we go out and represent Jesus, not because of ourselves, but because of God, because of Jesus that he's alive, because of Jesus that he's on the throne, because of the Holy Spirit that's at work to meet people and to call people, and, and, and um, to actually transform and empower us. Because it's amazing to think about just how confident Peter is right, ne- right now, but to think like just a couple of months ago, like to... It's in the story of Jesus, like when Peter is, is just about to deny Jesus and falling away, it's, a, it's crazy to think that in a couple of months, Peter's going to confront the Jews with this powerful message and thousands of people are going to be converted. Like God just transforms him. And actually, God may want to transform many of us. He wants to use all of us to be his witnesses. And actually, maybe we've, this has been something we've been stuck in in the past, but actually, maybe that's not the future that actually God wants to give us confidence to represent him and to work through him. Because he is at work in 
in the world, and he's even at work in our community. There's, there's been different stories, even recently, of God just drawing people back to himself. And it's not even because of us, it's the Holy Spirit who's doing our work, and we get to be a partner in that. Um, uh, I listen to Mark Sayers a lot, and he does a lot of cultural commentary, and he was saying recently, he's just hearing lots of stories of people who were really opposed to God, who, who, who people would talk to him and say, I have got this friend, I never thought they would believe, and now they believe. Like, God has done something. And maybe actually God's doing something powerfully in the world at the moment, and we actually get to be a part of that. But actually, we just need to step in with confidence that he wants to use us, that he wants to work through us. So we're invited to that today. And as well, with this, this good news, that the gospel is this good news about our future, is good news right for now, it's good news that it covers our past. And you might be here and you've never actually come to believe Jesus and follow him. And the invitation is, is for you is to choose to follow Jesus, is to repent, which means turn away from life without him and turn toward him, to, to confess that he is Lord, to demonstrate that through baptism is a way as well. And I've actually got, I put out at the table some of these booklets that, we have these at Church of Christ booklets about baptism. Um, if that's something you've never done, but you believe in Jesus, I encourage you to, to have a look at that and to think about that as, as a way to fully um, demonstrate that faith publicly um, of, of being um, in, in communion with Jesus. And as we respond today, um, just thought um, to really offer to come forward for prayer for anyone who would, would seek to have more of God's power and more of that confidence, particularly to represent Jesus, potentially with family or in, or in work or in some way. Um, this, Peter can do this because of the Holy Spirit. And we can ask each other for the Holy Spirit to fill us more and more. So if you'd like prayer for that, please come forward. Um, today as well. Um, but we might just pray that for everybody as well as, as we finish. So if you could stand um, stand um, together, because we all need more of God's presence and power to give us confidence. I put him on the spot, but maybe Joel, you could pray for that. Yeah, Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you um, yeah, that you don't send us out without your power. And um, yeah, I just want to ask that you just, yeah, forgive us for the times where we've been in situations where um, we've failed just to tell people who you are, failed to testify of your power um, because of fear, because of um, timidness. Um, but I ask that right now that you would, that you would fill us all afresh um, with boldness to proclaim the gospel. Father, that thank you that you have given us not a spirit of timidity, but of power and of love and of discipline. And so awaken us to your power in us, awaken us to your power upon us. And we just ask and pray for a release of your power, um, yeah, upon us to proclaim the gospel and Jesus. And even this week, as we go out into our different uh, spheres of influence, we ask that you would open up opportunity um, to just to do that and that you would soften people's hearts around us, in our families, in our friends and at work and that you would help us recognise those opportunities and just step out. Uh, step out in faith, believing that there is power in your gospel. It's not anything that we can do, but that when we testify of the good news of Jesus, you're the one that works. And we all want to see your power working in those around us. And so fill us afresh today that you may be glorified in Jesus.